we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Comic Con at Home. This is our personal, political, fictional, and factual panel in which our creators will tackle important topics that affect everyone, regardless of political affiliation or engagement. Um, you're uh, joining us today to look at historical events, alternate timelines, and um, things that probably felt like they were in our contemporary timeline when they were written and uh, maybe aren't so much now. So uh, welcome. I'm going to introduce our panelists, uh, starting with Durf Beck Durf. So Durf is the best-selling Eisner Award-winning author of My Friend Dahmer and Trashed. His forthcoming graphic novel, Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio, will be published by Abrams Comic Arts in September 2020. I believe it was originally intended to publish on the anniversary in May. Uh, yep. <laughs> Wonder what happened. <laughs> Welcome, Durf. Thanks. And Nicole Better. Brandy is the award-winning author of Little and Lion, Point, Finding Vaughn, the Revolution of Bertie Randolph, and the most recently, The Only Black Girls in Town. Her short fiction and essays have been published in several critically acclaimed anthologies for young people. She's on faculty at Hamline University's MFA program in writing for children and lives in Los Angeles. The voting booth is on sale the first week of July. Welcome, Brandy. Thank you. And Daniel G. Newman. Dan is a national expert on government accountability and money in politics. He's president and co-founder of MapLight, a nonpartisan nonprofit that promotes transparency and political reform. He's in hundreds of media outlets and lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Unrig is part of World Citizen Comics, a bold new line of nonfiction graphic novels designed to educate, entertain, and empower the citizens of tomorrow. Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy, <laughs> illustrated by George O'Connor, is Dan's first graphic novel, and it will also release the first week of July. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Alex Harrow. Alex is an ex-historian with lots of opinions and excessive library finds, TISC, currently living in Kentucky with her husband and their semi-feral children. She won a Hugo Award for her short fiction and has been nominated for the Nebula, Locus, and World Fantasy Awards. The Once and Future Witches is scheduled for October publication. Welcome, Alex. Thanks. Hi. Hi. And Charles Yu. Charles is the author of three books, including the novel How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, he received the National Book Foundation's 535 Award and was nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his work on the HBO series Westworld. He's also written for other TV shows and his fiction and nonfiction have appeared in multiple publications. Interior Chinatown was released in January of this year. Welcome, Charles. Thanks. And our co-authors, Victoria Jameson and Omar Muhammad. Victoria is the creator of graphic novels All's Fair in Middle School and Newbery Honor winner Roller Girl. She received her BFA in illustration from the Rhode Island School of Design and worked as a children's book designer before becoming a freelance illustrator. She's also worked as a portrait artist aboard a cruise ship and has lived in Australia, Italy, and Canada now she lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and son. Welcome, Vicki. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And Omar spent his childhood at the Dadaab camp after his father was killed and he was separated from his mother in Somalia. He devoted everything to taking care of his younger brother, Hassan, and to pursuing his education. He now lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, with his wife and five children, and works at a center to help resettle other refugees. He is the founder of Refugee Strong, a nonprofit organization that empowers students living in refugee camps. And Omar and Victoria's book, When Stars Are Scattered, published in April. So, uh, I will... Um, kind of contextualize this by pointing out that although viewers are watching this in July during Comic-Con at home, 
this is actually being pre-recorded in mid-June, more specifically, actually, on Juneteenth. And so um, uh, just a reminder to the audience that they need to uh, recognize that the discussion is taking place in this timeline on Emancipation Day. And um, so things that are current as we record may or may not be completely current as of the viewing. So um, let's just sort of take the deep dive up front. Let's talk about how the current state of the pandemic and dealing with systemic racism and sexism uh, dealing with the state of immigration, the role of police in our communities, and taking action like voting and a good citizen of the world tie into your So, um, Brandy, do you want to start us since, uh, you know, the, the action and voting kind of ties into your work? So yeah, I, I wrote this, you know, last year, so I did not expect anything that was happening um, right now, but it's strange to sort of see some of the things um, that are happening right now mirror what goes on in the book, like voter suppression and, you know, the really long lines and not being able to vote and having to wait for hours and hours all day. So I did not predict that that would happen, but since it's been an ongoing issue, you know, pretty much since this country was founded, like, I figured that it would still be um, relevant today. Um, I kind of figured that, you know, the book coming out, like the election would be the biggest thing that we were talking about <laughs> this year. So when the pandemic hit, uh, I was pretty surprised, uh, but still hopeful that people would realize that, you know, the election's coming up. There's gonna be a lot of uh, ways to try to get us to not vote and a lot of ways to suppress people. And so hopefully we'll, we can still kind of keep our eye on the prize, make sure that's an important part of our future. All right. Um, everybody sort of has different topics, so anyone is welcome to go next. I think uh, building on what Brandy was saying about voter suppression, the, um, in my book I talk about the agenda of a handful, relative handful of billionaires to try and disable government, and voter suppression is the main part of that tactic, and trying to change the country so only the wealthiest people and the wealthiest corporations get to decide uh, who governs us. And, and so I've been pleased to bring that story uh, into, into graphic novel form to make it more accessible and to talk about some of the people around the country who are unrigging voting and, and making voting more expansive as well as getting money out of politics and redrawing the lines of redistricting all these citizen stories to, to try and solve these democratic problems. Yeah, I, uh, I participate a lot in romance uh, conversations, and one of the recent discussions was, you know, let's let's have, um, you know, a, a billionaire be the villain, not the attainable hero in romance. Is um, and uh, and I think sometimes cultural reinforcement plays a role in in some of our choices, which may be something that uh, that Charles would speak to. Yes. Um, uh, can you hear me? All right. I I I'm glad you made the note about um, this taking place in June, because I mean, what could possibly happen between now and July? The world might only change, you know, three times in, in the space of that. Right now, at this moment, it feels like the election is impossibly far away. Um, it, it, for me, I just have this deep anxiety of, you know, here on Juneteenth, can this energy like be sustained for five more months? Um, will it translate into people going to the polls, um, people donating, people doing whatever they can? And, um, but I, I mean, at, for me, it's been an incredible few months in so many ways as, as for everyone. And, uh, it's, um, it also an exciting time to be a parent you know, having my kids live through and watch things um, on the news that uh, it, it feels like it's starting conversations even just within our family and among our friends and community that uh, we just haven't had. Um, so having a book come out in this year of all years, on the one hand, uh, is a little bit of a bummer because it, 
the conversation gets much more important. But on the other hand, the whole point was to enter into a conversation with people about something. So it's it's incredible that we're talking about the kinds of things we're talking about, in, in, including this panel. So. Surf or Alex, do you want to chime in a little bit on sort of historical perspective and how we're talking about this 50 years after Kent State and, you know, hundreds of years after the founding of, you know, the land of the free, quote unquote. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, I originally thought of doing Kent State as, as a cautionary tale, really, because it seemed like we had circled completely back around to 1970 when the country teetered on the edge of mass revolt and, you know, uh, the police crackdown was uh, brutal and, well, fatal. And, you know, we had this author authoritarian criminal president in charge of it all. Sound familiar? And then, you know, um, the pandemic happened. That threw everything out of whack. And, and now everything's blown up while my, you know, this book I wanted to be a cautionary tale is sitting in a warehouse waiting to be released in September. So it's kind of slow torture and uh, you know we'll just have to see how it how it all plays out. I, I can't imagine what the summer holds you know uh, nothing good I think. Um, you know, I'm happy to see people finally stepping up and taking to the streets I hope they don't you know we aren't putting ourselves in danger there from the virus but uh, it's about time which you know people started standing up and, and making their voices heard it's it's great but you know the lesson of Kent State is that when you threaten those in power um, the result can be tragic yeah um, I think all I have to really follow up with that is that my book is is set in the earlier American women's suffrage movement. Uh, and the premise is basically, what if suffragists, but they're witches, um, so I added magic, which is very satisfying for me. But I am finding it really strange because a lot of the research into my book was was a, this combination of like this triumphal narrative of women marching and getting the vote and horrible atrocities and failures and setbacks and just, con and and splits and divisions and a lack of collectivism that was just really disheartening. And I feel like I'm sort of living through a, a huge social movement right now and seeing similar moments of hope and things that are causing me a lot of excitement and worrisome trends at the same time. So it feels more relevant than I wanted or expected it to. <laughs> And Omar and Vicky, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of um, how the, the book that you worked on fits into this, whether it's the expectations that previously existed of sort of what the culture in the United States was versus the reality or the ways in which having knowledge beyond our borders are important to making us good citizens? Would you like to start, Omar? Can't actually uh, see for, for me, growing up in a refugee camp and living in a refugee camp for all my life, actually, almost all my entire life, and coming to America was a, a, a dream came true. But then when you face the reality, the one thing that we usually worry in the refugee camps uh, were food, shelter, so those day living. But here, one thing that we never worried about was re, re, facing a racism because everybody in the refugee camp was black. And that is the last thing we always think of. Someone who doesn't look like you or someone who doesn't dress like you or someone who doesn't speak like you. But in America, when we came in and uh, we were hoping uh, the struggle, we, we were hoping like the struggle we left behind. Now it looks like, and now I realized the, the struggle is in the beginning from, from, from every side. What we have been through for, from those refugee camps we started a new uh, a new struggle uh, in America, starting from uh, police brutality, in which we also faced in those in those in those refugee camps. Yeah, and speak, working on this project with Omar um, as an American and growing up in the U.S. was very eye-opening for me in many many ways. As other panelists have said, 
you know, we started this book well beyond before the pandemic started. Um, and so a lot of these issues have just been around for centuries all over the world. Um, so I think just having this pandemic now has brought some of those into sharper focus, but they've always been there. Um, like inequities in healthcare across the world. You know, it's easy to complain here in the US that we have to stay in our homes, but I'm just, at least I, you know, I have a home that I can stay in. I have running water where I can wash my hands. I can stay distance from other people. Um, so yeah, it's been an interesting, you know, bringing together this book and what's happening in the world now. One of the uh, sayings that uh, will probably resonate in particular with Alex is, you know, the, the personal is political. And I think in a certain way, the pandemic has allowed us all to see that, whereas we didn't necessarily see the gaps in the infrastructure before. Um, so uh, given what we're seeing now, how is that affecting either your personal work habits or uh, your next projects? You're gonna to have to call um, on somebody. Yeah, I, I can go. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm on a pretty busy uh, work schedule right now. I've got two books due this year that are coming out next year, um, and it's been it's been a real struggle. You know, I think the first couple months it was like it just kind of it was so new, and you know everybody was baking bread and just like enjoying their time with their families and everything, and just trying to get adjusted. And then it felt like reality really hit for me last uh, month in May, sort of, when the uprising started, but maybe even a little bit before that. Um, and then this month, I'm just realizing, wow, I've gotten nothing done. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, there are words getting down on the page. They're not the words necessarily that I, I don't know, they're coming a little, it's a little, coming a little bit harder for me. Um, but then I just think like, you know, everything that's going on right now is so important. And it's also, it's important to step away, but it's important to also take it in and be as present as I can in that. So I'm trying to remember that um, while I also struggle with these deadlines. <laughs> Guess I'll go. <laughs> um, I'm having uh, I'm having a lot of trouble writing. You know, it's just you're not relaxed. There's a lot of anxiety. You know, sleepless nights. Blah blah blah. Uh, recently, I've started writing again, so that's nice. I haven't been drawing much, though. I feel really kind of unproductive. You know, I had this whole, gosh, six-month book tour plan that went up in a puff of smoke. So it's, you know, kind of like, well, what do I do now? Um, you know, I'll figure it out eventually, but I think I just got to get really, just get drawing again. That's the only way out of it. But I don't know. I, I really haven't decided what my future work's going to be. I don't, I really don't know. I mean, Kent State was really intense, you know. I mean, it's this horrible tragedy and it's a brutal story and I don't know that I want to follow it up with another one that's, you know, so politically intense or a tragedy and maybe I want to do a comedy. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. It's really relieving to hear everybody be like, I, it's a struggle <laughs> to get words down right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm in a house with a one and three year old all the time Ooh. so that's how my work's been going uh we just had our babysitter come back this week for the first time and it's the best thing that's ever happened in the history of the world um i as far as what i'm working on i write speculative fiction fantasy mostly and and i've always felt i've thought of that as escapism and i'm kind of struggling right now with whether it should be or how much it should be or how much of the real to bring into your escapism um <laughs> and and what our responsibility is as people who are inventing other worlds to make them reflect the problems and realities that we face now versus to give people total fun and relaxation. So that's where I'm caught right now. I've been really motivated to take what's happening in the coronavirus and the world and connect it to the political themes that got us there because the coronavirus is new in a medical sense, but this lack of effective government that we're all experiencing is decades in the making. And so in Unrig, I go into great detail to expose how it is that government has got so weak and how it's devoted its attention to 
billionaires and corporations instead of the rest of us. And this is what we're all experiencing now. So I've been really driven to, to get that message out. One of yeah, the biggest it, things that's, oh, sorry, Charlie, do you want to go ahead? I, I also can't see you, Charlie. I think your video might be turned off. Huh, I'm sorry, can I, anyone else see me? Oh, nope, so maybe. because you're using your phone for your audio, when you speak, yeah. I can't see you. Oh, got it, oh, that's a problem, okay. I will turn that off, okay, how's that? Okay. Okay, Good. go for it, Victoria. You, you go. Oh, I'll, I'll go. After. What was I going to say? The, oh, so the, I think the main thing that's changed for me work-wise, because I usually stay at home when I'm writing my books, so that hasn't changed too much. But I think the big thing that changed for this book in particular was that, like other panelists have said, Omar and I had a book tour planned. And it's mainly a bummer because um, I think schools are, you know, we visit, we were supposed to visit elementary schools, and that's such a great way to meet and reach so many kids. And now that we've, you know, we've, we've been doing some virtual events, but again, like the inequities of, you know, what kids have access to iPads or who can do virtual learning has made a big impact on who we can share the story with. Um, and because Omar is such a great speaker with kids, like I was really looking forward to that selfishly. Hopefully that can happen in the future um, because I think that would have been a very special, I was really looking forward to that. I'll also add a quick thank you because I know on your personal site you have a video on drawing that you have put up for kids who do have access, which is very kind. Charlie or Omar? I'll go, uh, if you don't mind, Omar. I, can you guys hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, in term, for me, I, I've written some speculative fiction. I've also, uh, with this latest book, uh, you know, taken a turn into a more direct exploration of race and racial stereotypes. Um, and I, I'm, one, I'm glad I finished this book before the world completely changed twice in three months, uh, because I would have definitely thrown this book in the trash had, <laughs> had I had been halfway through it and, uh, uh, realize sort of, you know, how quickly things were changing and, and the ground was shifting underneath. Um, but, you know, if anything, it, it sort of uh, makes me excited about the possibility of imagining other realities. You know, I think that fiction writers in particular have a ability to uh, explore what's possible um, and, and sort of navigate the space between possible and and uh impossible and and sometimes push that boundary but even if that sounds too grandiose um at least sort of you know delineate the boundary i think that's all like important work um uh in terms of people's imaginations i mean Im imagination for me is part of what uh it has allowed people to see a different, you know, possibility. Um, and sometimes that involves a lot of upheaval, but it, it or maybe it always involves a lot of upheaval to, to really change things. But um, uh, it, it, it doesn't make me feel um, that my work is any more important. It just makes me feel like, well, if I'm going to have any kind of voice or platform to, to reach people, you know, then, then I can do that with words and just with my mind, even when I'm stuck at home. So um, in, in that sense, it's, a, it's sort of exciting. But I'm not getting anything done either. I mean, I'm definitely, <laughs> I say all that and I'm just like watching Netflix. So let's just be real about that for a second. This is really comforting that no one is, that I'm not, <laughs> everyone is having trouble writing. Sorry, everyone, but from my own selfish perspective, yeah, it's great. <laughs> I don't feel like such a loser. So while addressing hard topics and learning and having instructive or cautionary stories is important, um, one of the other things that I've been uh, participating in discussions of is the fact that um, we also need to be able to see joy for marginalized voices and marginalized communities. You know, it's one of the things I love about the voting booth in particular to call it out because, you know, it's 
about a lot of important stuff, but it's also a rom-com to a certain extent, um, you know, or to, you know, talk about the, the things that uh, Charlie and Alex touched on, which is sometimes with fiction, you can, you know, um, I mean, come on, who wouldn't have wanted witches as suffragettes or whatever? Um, so, so what, uh, other than maybe binging, you know, Netflix, um, are, are people doing to find joy at this time? I'll just uh, confess to everyone that I only recently, as an entire grown adult person, discovered romance novels, and they're great. They're fantastic. I don't know what I was doing with my life before. Uh, it's clearly what I need. And I also didn't realize that romance novels now are like often deeply political and smart in all these really interesting ways. So I just read Courtney Milan's, like, all of her books, um, and they have like women suffragettes and women scientists and historical settings. So it's completely my jam. It's basically all I can read right now. So that's what I'm doing for myself. Uh, are you, anyone else doing anything? Are you putting on your COVID-19 pounds because you're rage baking, which, you know, actually came from a lovely woman of color's Instagram feed, if I'm recalling correctly. What, uh, what are you doing to get through the day since the illusion that, you know, if you had nothing but time at home would make you super productive has obviously been broken? I'm well, reading a lot of comics. I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but the rest of you are Philistines if you're not reading comics. Um, I've been catching up on a lot of reading. So it's it's been studying old comics, EC War comics right now, which are really fun to like break down and look at how they, the narratives is constructed and things like that. Um, that's what I've been doing. I feel almost embarrassed to admit this now that everyone has said the opposite, but I actually have been doing a fair amount of work and that's what's bringing me joy because uh, it's a very, <laughs> sorry, sorry. We all celebrate this. We do. <laughs> but Bravo. for me, it's been a nice escape to, because um, it's a very lighthearted story. It's um, very different. And so it's just been a, such a nice escape to be like, like I did, now I have to think of how to decorate like two 12 year old bedrooms and like pick out their clothes. It's just um, the story part is written. I'm doing the fun part of drawing. So it's <laughs> been something for me to look forward to every day. And I've been on the work theme. I mean, so many people are spending so much more time online now. I've been able to engage with people more online. I made a website for my book, unrigbook.com, about how people can get involved in the democracy movement. And so you know, that's been the most fun thing is actually to work and connect with people online. Um, I feel like I'm doing a lot of cooking and baking um, and also just like getting back to talking on the phone, uh, cause I live alone. So I actually haven't really interacted in person with another human, um, you know, in any meaningful way in a few months now. So I just feel like I've been saying earlier before all of this happened that I wish people would get back to talking on the phone. So I'm kind of doing that, just staying reconnect or reconnecting with people and staying connected with people. It's been really nice. I have a couple of girlfriends who specifically have arranged phone calls with me, partly because, like me, they spend all day in online meetings. And they're like, I, I want to talk to you, but I don't want to, you know, don't want to meet with you virtually. Let's just talk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> I have been uh, enjoying with my baby newborn. Just oh. mm -hmm. it, it came a good time where everybody's home, me and my wife. And the rest of my kids are back home with my mom. So it is only me, my wife, and the little one that was just born. So it is, she started in the beginning sleeping at daytime, wake at night. So one of us has to go to sleep at night so, they, uh, so we can stay awake in the, at, at night time. So we, I really, really enjoyed uh, spending most of the time with the, with the baby. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a bonus. Our, my kids are a little older. Well, they're older. They're 11 and 12. And so I'm already like uh, counting down the days till 
you know, we don't get them anymore. So this is all a little bit of gravy, even though I'm sure they're pretty tired of us at this point. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So what thought would you like to leave the Comic-Con at home attendees with? Um, what's maybe a message of hope uh, other than the fact that, you know, um, as I think Charlie mentioned earlier, we're having these conversations and they're necessary conversations. And, you know, as Durf pointed out, sometimes they're painful, sometimes the change is, is difficult, but hopefully we'll make progress. Hopefully we're, we're moving forward to sort of realize the nation that I think some of us had thought we'd already achieved without recognizing the, the you know, inequities and the way that um, it was not representative of everybody. This was supposed to lead into being cheerful, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, I can tell you that I, I wrote UNRIG from working for 15 years to try and get money out of politics, improve voting, ger anti-gerrymandering, fix our democracy. And I would meet people across the country who were doing this and people who are regular people, maybe they hadn't been involved in politics before and they get together with other people and they, they change their states and they improve their, they've been, they continue to improve our country. And those stories were not in other books and their stories were not in the media. So that's where I wrote Unrig to tell these stories. And I think one of the feedback that's been gratifying from the book is that people are inspired and positive to see these examples. And that, uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And at unrigbook.com, which I mentioned earlier, that has a list of groups in your state that you can get involved with to be part of that movement to fix our democracy. Okay, I don't know how hopeful or effective this would be, but like my, my ending message would be essentially that if I learned one thing from looking at the suffrage movement in America, it's that it's really slow and frustrating and has a lot of setbacks. Uh, but that in the end, collective action does kind of work. Like what we're seeing now is radical and, and scary in a lot of ways for a lot of people, but it's effective change and it's the beginning of a social movement and I think it's fantastic. I, can I go really quick? Um, I, you know, in my book, not to spoil it, uh, but ends with, uh, or, or leads up to a big courtroom scene and part of the reason why is because in the history of sort of Asian Americans and Asian immigrants to America, the courts have been an important tool for them to attain legal statuses where they had no political power. Um, in a week where, you know, the, in the news, we're seeing Supreme Court decisions, you know, two in a week that um, basically acc accorded people's status. I mean, very different decisions, but um, uh, LGBTQ people and then the dreamers, I mean, in one week, and it's a reminder to people that as much as we can talk about court packing or the politicization, politicization of the courts, um, the, there is still um, the rule of law here, despite the president's efforts to erode it for almost four years now. Um, and there is still hope that people can use the, you know, this, the institutions that have existed here despite their, their very complicated and often brutal history um, can be a force for change. And, and obviously voting would be, you know, sort of the, the most powerful vote. So for me, it's hopeful to see a headline where uh, what is considered a, a conservative Supreme Court could still hand, hand down decisions that would go against what, you know, you, you might um, just assume on paper would be their decision. And that, that brings me hope. Um, oh, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I feel like, you know, I write for um, children and teenagers, and I think it's easy to get sort of pessimistic the older you get, as you've seen, you know, history kind of repeat itself and, and things not go maybe the way you want it to go. But I think when you write for kids, there's often sort of um, not pressure, but just like, um, your editors kind of want you to have a bit of hope in there, end on a bit of hope. And I think that can be really important to remember right now. And especially thinking about, you know, when I was a teenager and 
and teens today just thinking like, I can change the world. And then, you know, some of that kind of goes away the older you get. So I hope that we can kind of have some of that attitude of younger folks and just keep hoping and keep persisting. Well, um, you know, Kent State is not a hopeful book. <laughs> There's no happy ending there. Um, and the aftermath of it is something we're still dealing with in not good ways, such as the militariz militarization of police. That's directly from 1970. So I don't really have any happy thoughts there. Um, I guess I'll direct my, my hopeful um, prediction to, you know, the comics community and that, you know, this freaking virus will eventually pass and we will all meet again. You know, there'll be another Comic-Con, there'll be another Angolem, there'll be another SPX and we'll get back to, to doing the stuff that we love. And that's all I got. <laughs> for me, uh, for me, this was the first book I've ever written. I've co-authored with Victoria Jameson and it's totally based on my, me and my younger brother growing up in a refugee camp who has uh, intellectual disability. And I have been listening from the news more often about refugee issues or immigra immigration affairs become a, a political thing nowadays for, for politicians. Some people saying we don't know who is coming to our country. And, uh, and I really wanted to, to put this, my personal story out because from the refugee side's perspective, we know who we are ourselves. And also the government itself knows us. Because for me, for example, in my case, I left my home country when I was about three, four years old. And then for, the, for my entire life, I was under the United Nations. I have been interviewed, be interviewed, screened, be screened without the United States approval. I will not put a, a step uh, in, into this country. So the idea when I hear about experts, so-called experts and so-called politicians, who happens to visit in a refugee camp for one day or two days and then they, they know all the issues of those refugees or those immigrants. One thing they can, during the campaign they said was, we don't know some countries, they have to identify those people, for example. For me, if you ask Somalia, go find, uh, give us some details about Omar, they will have zero information about me. Who has most information about me is the U.S. government who has interviewed me, screened me, screened me. And uh, those immigrants, those refugees are human beings like me and you. And one thing I always tell people is no human being wants to be a refugee at any, at any level. No human being. That's the last thing I personally wanted was to leave my home country and live in a refugee camp where I had nothing. And I, I also don't want to get separated from my mom and I don't want my father to be the victim of that syphilis that had been in, in, in my home country. So when I'm walking down in the streets and someone, not only me, the refugees that I welcome, that I work with here in America, when they are told go back to where from, that, that simple message goes very far, it's really helpful. For me, I always tell them, you just, everyone came to this country one time, we just happened to be the last that came. So you, the, no one shouldn't be closing their doors from us. Someone else let you in to come to this country. Since we are the last, please do not, not, not close uh, uh, your doors from, from those who are still fleeing for their lives. And we always forget those who lost their life when they're seeking for refuge. We always talk about those who make it, but we forget those who lost their life when they were seeking a refuge, including children. So that's the message I, I will leave, although it's not a happy message that, that I would like to end. I'll try and, I'll try and add the happy note to that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think also like what Brandy said, that if you write for kids, you kind of can't help but have some hope in you because kids are just awesome. Like they're so full of energy and you know, we've heard from so many kids and parents who've said like, my kid read this book four times in a row and now they're, started fundraising and they've started reaching out to local organizations to see how they can volunteer. Um, so I see a lot of hope in that and just, um, just the love and joy that kids can, can bring. I'll just briefly interrupt to say thank you all for that book because my husband is actually a children's librarian part-time here in rural Kentucky. And I think last week, your all's book was his like book of the week that he highlighted on his little a uh, Facebook video channel, so thank you. It's reaching oh. even rural Kentucky. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Well, and I'll take us out by saying thank you to all of you for your contributions. Um, you know, uh, I think as we all move forward collectively, we can take lessons of history, lessons of empathy, lessons of hope, lessons of joy, and, um, and they can energize us. And, uh, and I appreciate everything that you all have contributed. So um, uh, there'll be a list of the books um, that will be attached to the video when it airs. They'll all be available from longtime San Diego Comic-Con bookseller, Mysterious Galaxy. There'll be a link there and they're also uh, available whatever their publication dates may be. I know some of them are pretty far out, September, October uh, from uh, local bookstore as well. So thank you all again. And um, here's to Juneteenth becoming a national holiday. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.